the mic? Or do I need the microphone? Oh, you need a microphone. Okay. Uh, so thank you for being here uh, this morning. Uh, so I'm doing my talk um, on this paper uh, titled Automated Image Quality Evaluation of T2 Weighted Liver MRI Utilizing Deep Learning Architecture. This was published in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance Imaging in 2018. So I actually really like this paper. Um, you have to do a whole lot of research, though, if you don't understand deep learning, which I did. So if you don't know anything about deep learning, um, I'm going to explain the very basics in this talk, um, and then I'm going to go through and critique the paper. Uh, so, just to give you some motivation, so uh, typically routine abdominal, abdominal MRI is used to evaluate chronic liver diseases, and for example, such as uh, liver cirrhosis or focal liver lesions. And MRI is used because of the soft tissue contrast properties, so um, it's very useful for looking, at, for looking at liver cirrhosis in this case in particular. Um, although the problem with MRI is that it suffers from um, inconsistent image quality and motion artifacts due to long scan times. And uh, the T2 weighted sequences uh, can yield suboptimal image quality, um, especially when tissues have similar properties, especially if you want to look at a certain tissue and it has a, and it has a similar property to a normal tissue um, compared to a lesion. So um, a recent study did show that 55% of images are deemed as non-diagnostic. And um, this is because of the motion, uh, this, this is primarily because of uh, uh, motion artifacts. So this is a non-diagnostic image of, of a cirrhotic liver. And um, basically in this talk, what they're going to try and do, um, just so I, I don't, I don't want to try and spoil it, but they're going to try to determine, use deep learning to determine whether an image is non-diagnostic, which looks like this. And you can't even see where the liver is because there's a, um, another part of the body has been superimposed on it due to motion artifacts versus diagnostic, so image that can be used. So the whole purpose of this paper is that they want to improve image quality and acquisition speed. Real now, quick, real quick uh, yeah. to um, just review on the motivation here. Wouldn't, wouldn't the MR technologists just be able to easily see this and then just repeat the image? Yeah, so they want to be able to do that in real time while the patient is on the table. But I'll explain that later. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's just because it, it takes a while to get the image, and then they, when they get it, they realize that oh, it's not diagnostic, you can't use it. I see. So you want to be able to make the determination before the image is even generated, like before it's reconstructed. As, as the patient is on the table, yeah. That's, that's what I understood from their paper. Okay. Because they want to be able to do it in real time. But in real time, that means not, not in image space. Then. Right. Right. Like yeah. in case space. So you're actually monitoring case space. To find it. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Yep. They didn't mention that, but yeah, that's that would be that's right. Okay. Um, so when it comes to assessing image quality, um, one thing that I do, well, that I've been doing during my rotation is using an ACR phantom. So we use this phantom to basically uh, calculate SNR uniformity, ghosting, and geometric distortion, for example. Um, the advantages are that it's subjective, um, it's consistent because um, you're doing the same scans every time. And it can also uh, be automated. But the disadvantage is that you can't address, uh, it can't address adequacy for a diagnostic task. So it can't tell you whether you can see a lesion or not. So they wanted to come up with more task-based qualitative metrics um, to assess uh, how conspicuous a lesion is. And uh, one way is to do a quantitative, uh, to, uh, develop quantitative metrics to evaluate new sequences uh, for image quality. And past studies have used scoring metrics uh, to assess lesion conspicuity. Um, for example, one paper used the Likert scale, which is basically like a five-point scale. So from one to five, uh, grade how well you can see the tumor, or from one to five, grade how severe the artifact is. So it's just basically a grading scale. Um, but the problem is this requires a trained radiologist to be available. Um, and this can introduce interreader var variability and also increase wait time, et cetera. So they wanted to automate these task-based approach, and they wanted to enable, um, so that would enable real-time scanning optimization, so while the patient is on the table. Um, however, these qualitative tasks are more difficult um, to automate, and the acceptability of these images uh, is subject to human assessment. So the solution, they think, is to automate feature extraction. And a very promising field that has been used for assessing featured 
uh, extraction is known as machine learning. But there's an a, a artificial intelligence uh, subdivision of machine learning known as deep learning, which is what they use in this paper. So um, I don't know what everyone's background is on machine learning or deep learning, but I'll give you uh, just a very simple overview. So in, in machine learning, you start off with your, your training data, um, and then you do a feature extraction. Um, so in this case, like, you know, you have the ears of the cat here pointing, and you can pick out these little features here. Then you run it through the machine learning model classification. And then when you go through with your testing data, if you put in an image of the cat, you hope that it'll It'll identify those features, and, and, and the algorithm will tell you that's an image of a cat. Deep learning actually uses the images directly. So after you train the algorithm, um, you can put in an image, and then it will tell you, well, this is uh, this is an image of a car. So it'll it'll spit out, well, this is a 95% chance that this is an image of a car, and like 3% truck, 2% bicycle. So um, the, I'm going to go into kind of explaining the guts of this deep learning algorithm just for this paper. They didn't go into it, but it's, uh, I think it's vital that I go into it because their uh, the deep learning algorithm that they use is pretty complicated. So this is the convolutional neural network, it's called that because it actually has convolutional layers. So this is your, if this is your input here, um, so this is like a number seven, uh, an image of the number seven. Um, basically, you it's, It'll be input into the into the CNN. Um, it'll go through this uh, uh, node here, and it'll be convolved, and then it'll be spit out, and then it will go into this one here, and it'll be spit out to the next one eventually until it gets to the final output. So these convolutional uh, layers are actually just convolution functions, and they're there to, because they're able to detect patterns uh, such as uh, features in the image, um, like edges, corners, or squares, and um, it was noted that deeper layers can detect larger objects. So I'm, I'm assuming that the um, that their uh, more shallow layers can detect finer details, and then their deeper la layers can detect larger uh, objects or larger details. And then you'll get a final uh, sorry final output final output not input. Um, so for example, let's say the image shows the number seven. So with the initial input, if this is your image here. Um, it's basically uh, just an image of, it's just, you know, a matrix of pixels, and uh, when it goes through those layers, it gets convolved with a filter, and uh, so basically you just do the dot product, take, uh, take the dot product of this area and this filter, and you add a number here, and then you keep doing that throughout the entire uh, matrix, and then it's passed on to the next layer as an input. And so this is what happens in each layer when, it, when they try to extract features. So you have your input image. So in layer one, you'll have a filter that has negative ones here, which will correspond to the black regions here. Positive ones here will correspond to the white regions, and zeros that will correspond to the gray. And what it will do is it will actually extract these features right here, the bottom of seven, and maybe these ones here. So then when, it, when this image, oops, so when this image goes on to the next layer, you'll have another convolution filter. So it's kind of similar, but um, uh, rotated. And it will extract these features here. And it, then this will go on to the next layer, and then these features will be extracted, and so forth. So that hopefully by the end, um, by the time it gets through the entire algorithm, it'll know for sure, hopefully over 90% sure, that the image is of the seven. And one other thing that they do, um, and they mentioned this in the paper, is that they actually zero pad um, their input of all of their input images. Um, so this image here would be zero padded uh, just to preserve the size of the image as it's going through the algorithm. So if you convolve the image, you can see here that this, this image is smaller. Um, and so they don't want the image to keep shrinking as it goes through. They want to maintain the original size. So they just keep zero padding as they, as they, um, so, whoops. so they just keep zero padding these images. So this one would be zero padded, this one would be zero padded, and so forth. So their objective, I think, was very clear in this uh, in this paper. They wanted they wanted to create a convolutional neural network of deep learning algorithm that could identify livers with T2 weighted images, including nine, with non-diagnostic uh, image quality. Um, the paper, as I mentioned, was clear on this objective, and I don't think this is uh, hypothesis-driven work. 
So just to go into the study design, so for the MRI protocol, the patients were scanned on 1.5T or 3T magnet with the torsophase array coil. Um, all liver examinations were routinely included in 2D situated sequences uh, with frequency selective fat suppression. So these are typical parameters. Um, I looked it up. These are typical. These are typical parameters that uh, are used to uh, scan uh, for liver lesions. Uh, and the study design uh, was basically a case series, uh, so which is a group or series of cases, case reports involving patients who were given similar treatment. So for these cases, an MRI of the liver with or without contrast is performed uh, for indicating of known or suspected liver cirrhosis of focal liver lesions evaluated over a period dating from November 2014 to, to uh, May 2016. So they're very clear on that. Um, they actually searched uh, 1,600 cases, but then they uh, took a random sample of 522. Um, they were randomly selected, and cases were either labeled as diagnostic or non-diagnostic, and they were labeled by two radiologists. So the radiologists label these images, and then these images are then passed through the CNN uh, deep learning algorithm, and then they compare um, how well the deep learning algorithm did with the radiologist, which you'll see soon. Um, and as I mentioned, oh yeah, the non-diagnostic, you saw that the image before, um, so that image just can't be used, versus diagnostic, which is an image that can be used to assess uh, the relation. Um, yeah, so um, 351 cases were used for actually training the data, uh, sorry, training the, uh, the deep learning algorithm, and 171 cases were used for testing. So you do have to train the CNN algorithm, and basically what you're trying to do is each um, neuron has a weight assigned to it, so these weights will, will keep changing as you're training them, and during the training, um, they, will, they will be updated uh, to reach their optimal values. So um, in terms of how they will be optimized, depends on the optimization function that's being used. Um, um, so which is basically just a cost function, and they also call it a minimize, they also want to minimize that loss function, which is how they put it, which is basically just to reduce the error um, of what the algorithm predicts versus what the truth, um, which, is, which, which is what the actual uh, result should be um, to get your final output. So, as I mentioned, the result might be that the image shows the number, that, that the output might be, oh, well, the image shows the number seven, or there's a, you know, 75% chance this image is of number seven. So, the, as I mentioned, there, this is their, uh, the CNN that they use. So, it's pretty complicated, but um, these are the number of inputs, I guess, they, that they could put in. And then you have a convolutional uh, layer here. And then you have an activation layer. So an activation layer just decides if the neuron is going to fire or not. And then you have a pooling layer um, behind that. So a pooling layer reduces the amount of parameters and computation in the network. And then it gets, keeps getting passed through all these layers, as I mentioned before. So it does go through all the convolutions and everything. And then you get to this layer here, the fully connected layer. And this layer attempts to learn everything um, from the previous layers, which is um, the nonlinear combinations of all the features that, is, that you're trying to extract. And then basically, it gets down to the end, where um, the images are either uh, determined to be non-diagnostic or, or diagnostic in this case. Um, of course, other deep learning algorithms can have a uh, different number of outputs, but in this case, they're just trying to determine whether the images are non-diagnostic or diagnostic. But this is the uh, schematic that they showed in their paper. So for training, they used 351 uh, tissue weighted uh, image cases out of the 522 data sets um, uh, from the clinical liver exams that were anonymized. Uh, for each case, they used the 10 uh, middle 2D transaxial slices, um, and this is because it tends to cover the area of the liver. Um, they resized it to have an apparent resolution of uh, 3 millimeters per pixel. Apparently that was needed for uh, the deep learning algorithm, and they zero padded to preserve the original size of the image, as I mentioned. Um, and then the 150 by 150 pixels for uh, patches were duplicated into three channels. So it's resulting in a 150 by 150 by 3 tensor as the input of the network. So they didn't really explain what a tensor was, but um, I looked it up. And uh, basically, the tensor is just like it's just an input. 
and you have four. It's it's, it's usually uh, it's usually it's four spots. So the first two here are just the width and the height of the image, and then the third the third one here is the color channels. So um, you put three for RGB, which is what they did, and then you put grayscale. If, if you if you want to see a grayscale, then you put one. And this one here is for the number of images that are being used. So in their case, for the training data, they would have 351. And then to actually test and validate that uh, these learning algorithms, they uh, they used 171 cases um, that were sequestered for the blind test, and they fed that into the CNN model. And uh, they selected the, the middle seven slices um, to be assessed by the learning models. They didn't really specify why they used different number of slices to do the assessment. Um, but uh, that was a mystery to me, actually, because uh, I thought they would use the same number of slices for the testing and the training data. Um, so then when they do the statistical analysis, uh, they would label the output from the algorithm compared to the radiologist. Uh, so basically, they are just comparing with what the radiologist had said. Um, there were two radiologists, um, and also the inter-reader variability was measured, um, which is good. Uh, the statistical methods were not specified in detail. A lot of them were referenced. So um, they used a confusion matrix uh, to actually produce the results. Um, and this is a commonly used method for evaluating machine learning algorithms. So if you don't know what a confusion matrix is, um, I, I'm going to explain it in the next slide. But it does it did give a lot of uh, um, it did. It did uh, really explain, it, it kind of validated what their objective was in the paper. So, and you get a lot of data from it. Which is um, so the confusion matrix will tell you what your machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm did right or what it did wrong. Um, so it kind of answers the question like how well did your deep learning algorithm train itself. Uh, so the size of the confusion matrix is determined by the number of things we want to predict. Um, so in this case, uh, we're just predicting if the images are diagnostic versus non-diagnostic. Uh, so therefore, it'll be a two by two matrix, which is good because it actually fits on the slide. Uh, <laughs> so this is a confusion matrix. Uh, the rows represent what the uh, model predicts versus what the radiologist um, assigns as non-diagnostic or diagnostic. So you have your true positive, false positive, uh, false negative, and true negatives. And you'll see why I label these very soon. Um, so you can get the sensitivity from this. Um, it tells you the percentage, percentage of patients with non-diagnostic image quality that were correctly identified. Uh, you can get specificity. So it tells us the percentage of patients with diagnostic image quality that were correctly identified. Um, and then they also calculated the PPV. I'm trying to remember what that was now. <laughs> um, I'll look that up after. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, and then there's a negative predictive value. Uh, I just didn't want to mess up the, the wording on that. But it's the probability that subjects with a positive screening uh, test would truly have the disease versus if they don't. Um, and I provided the oops, provided the equations uh, here up top. So these are the results. Um, this is the confusion matrix that they produced. Uh, I'll just go through them pretty quickly. Um, so. For reader one, they assume. Oh, for reader one, uh, um, they they labeled that 86 percent of the images uh, were diagnostic, but the algorithm said that 74 percent were diagnostic, and then the uh, the reader said that 14 percent were non-diagnostic versus 25 percent as as non-diagnostic. So there is a difference between the two. Um, so agreement between reader one and the algorithm uh, was 75 percent of cases. So I don't know if that's good. they didn't really specify if that was good or bad. I don't think that it was the result that they were hoping for. Um, I think, but I'll go into that later when they when they went into the discussion. They kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, in 119 of 135 concordant cases, there was agreement between reader one and the algorithm that the images were diagnostic. And for 16 out of 135, uh, those were not diagnostic. And then uh, 28 out of 36 disagreements for reader one labeled as diagnostic, the algorithm labeled as non diagnostic. And then 8 out of 36 disagreements between reader one and were labeled non diagnostic, and the algorithm labeled as diagnostic. So they, they went into pretty good detail with their results. 
Um, they specify the, the sensitivity, the specificity, the PPV, and the NP, NPV. Then they did the same thing for Reader 2. Uh, so just to show the comparison, so you know, Reader 2 uh, oops, had 80% diagnostic versus 74.3% diagnostic, and then 20% uh, non-diagnostic versus 25% non-diagnostic. Um, so you know. There's a little bit of a difference between the two. Um, there's agreement between Reader 2. Uh, the, the agreement between Reader 2 and the algorithm uh, was 73% versus 97%. And then 16 out of 125 concordant cases, uh, there was agreement between Reader 1 and the algorithm that the images were non-diagnostic. And then 28 out of 46 disagreements between Reader 1 were labeled non-diagnostic, where the algorithm labeled it as diagnostic. And then they reported their sensitivity, specificity, PPV, and NPV. Did you say in the training data set how many were diagnostic? No. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, and I actually go into that a little bit. And they do too, because they, it's weird that they didn't specify it, um, because I mean, they could all be. You know, majority of them could be diagnostic, or majority of them could be non-diagnostic. So it was kind of like a mystery. As to, I don't know why they didn't report it, to be honest. And was it just defined by what the reader said it was? I mean, that was the gold standard, right? Yeah. So, what is, so it would be the slide that says this is what the reader said was diagnostic. Right, right. Yes. But are they training it? Uh, are they running this twice, once for each reader? How do you resolve the script? For training model. Yeah, they're actually, um, they, they do this uh, agreement between readers assessment. Um, uh, on this but when you're video. training, you, when you're running through your training set, you need to know the truth, what's the truth. Right. No, I, I, I agree. And that's, I, I think, um, that's a drawback to the paper is, is because they're, the actual disagreement between them was 88%. So, I mean, they, even the readers couldn't agree on whether some of the images were non-diagnostic versus diagnostic. Um, and I think it goes to my question as well at the beginning is that actually the determination of this is rather subtle. <coughs> and so the technologist can't be expected to necessarily make right. that call. Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. it's probably really a continuous variable as yeah. opposed to a uh, classification as you want, a regression kind of a, you showed a really bad one, but there's probably borderline cases. Yeah. Wow. Work right, and I, I'm not sure about, uh, I don't know what the quality of the images were for the training data either, so they didn't really specify that because, I mean, um, uh, I learned like a few weeks ago that when you're training your, when you're training your algorithm, you have to know exactly what, um, you have to know everything about that image. So you really have to know if it's, in this case, if it's non-diagnostic versus diagnostic, but you have to be really sure. And it didn't seem like even these readers were 100% sure. Like they weren't even 95% sure. They didn't. They didn't agree with each other 95% of the time. So that that's an issue, I think. You know, and that might be why. That may be the the the, the main reason why they didn't get the results that they hoped for. Um, just because it wasn't trained properly, I think personally. Um, because they, maybe they just didn't know what they were doing. They just thought, oh, okay, well, if we just train it. You know, if we have radiologists, they know what they're doing, and then they label these images, and we train them. We train the, the algorithm with these images that it'll spit out the results that we want. Um, and I don't think that's, I mean, that's not really what happens, so. Did you mention anything about how people like transfer learning? Like, because the data set just seems a little bit small to generate an image from scratch. Yep. Um, so that's an interesting factor. Yep. Yeah, um, and actually I learned uh, a few weeks ago that, uh, from, I don't know if this is what you sort of touched on, but um, you can train your algorithm with a small data set as long as you really know a lot about that data set. Like, you, you have to know for sure whether, in this case, whether the images are not diagnostic or diagnostic. They have to be really sure. So transfer learning is more you develop your algorithm on a really large data set that a lot of people use on the like, image set. Which has millions of images, and then fine tune it based off of their data and their computation they're trying to achieve. Right. So you really have that base uh, normal effort to start with. They just fine tune it. If they did, they didn't specify it. Yeah, but that's, that's a good point. Oh, 
don't think that's what their goal is. But I think in this case, like for this paper, um, they're actually just taking images that are, that, yeah, they're fully reconstructed. Um, just, just to test it. So they're not there yet, and they're not in the real time yet. But that's kind of their motivation, like where they want it, where they want to go. Uh, it doesn't seem like that to me. That was the, like one of the critiques I had on the paper as well. I mean, I I just think that the, the data that they were training with, with um, may not have been bad, but I think they needed to have a really clear. If you're if you're going to put in like an image that's non-diagnostic for and diagnostic, I think both readers have to be 100% um, sure of which one uh, have to be in agreement with with 100% uh, that they're non-diagnostic. Um, so they should have thrown away any cases where the reader didn't disagree. And maybe their their algorithm would have been better. Yeah, for any more readers. Yeah, yeah, to reduce the error. Yeah. I wonder, like, if they can put uh, some like borderline cases, you know, like instead of using this label as like diagnostic and not diagnostic, and then ended up having diagnostic or not diagnostic. If there's any discrepancy between reader one and reader two, they can do to say borderline. Yeah, and then yeah. you know you have a set of two category, like you will have a diagnostic and non-diagnostic, and some gray area. So the technology right. has some information, like okay, this is not so sure. Then yeah. you know you just as a backup, you just get again. Like that, I guess that because the goal is they want to implement for the clinical use, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that is definitely saving time, no matter what. In this case, right? I, I guess. It's yeah, I think if they wanted to have borderline cases, they'd have to have the, the readers agree on which ones are non-diagnostic and, and diagnostic. They, they, I think that's like the, the fundamental is like if they don't agree, then just throw, the, throw that case away. Uh, find a case where they actually do agree and then use that data to train the algorithm. I, I think, I suspect. I mean, they'd have to do yeah. that again. Yeah, but I guess like if this is a real scenario that uh, disagreement Cases should be included because that's what. Oh yeah, no, that's yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. Some people can read it, some people can't read it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. But you said, Randy, that this is a species plot now. All for the whole thing. It could be incredibly powerful if it identifies all the ones the readers agree on as run diagnostic yeah. triggers of therapy. Yeah. We can. <laughs> yeah, I feel like when they publish this paper, um, you know, it's kind of their first run through, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why don't you just take a step back and, you know, take all the, you know, take all the images away that where the readers didn't agree, and then run it again, and then, you know, test it, you know, test it in, in different ways. But they didn't do that in, for this paper. So, yeah. That's cute. So for learning that you can why. So I'm just curious, in your opinion, do you think it would be possible to just as technology to give a definition of what is a diagnostic image and frame the system based on that versus yeah, just trying to figure out? I think, in the, I think um, they didn't specify, but I think diagnostic is whether or not they could, they could use the image. Uh, well, they well they explained what the, the diagnostic was, which is uh, basically like if they could use that image to detect uh, cirrhosis or a liver lesion. Um, so I think that you know if a radiologist was looking at an image that was kind of poor quality, kind of borderline, but they could still read it, maybe they would label that as diagnostic. Versus the other radiologist would say, oh well, you know, yeah, I can see it, but it's like this image is contaminated with an artifact. So. I'll, I'll label that as non-diagnostic. So maybe they can still see it, but they'll label it as non-diagnostic. And I wasn't clear in the paper as to you know how, like what the criteria was for labeling it. It just sounded like, well, they had two radiologists come in and they they read, you know, they went through all these cases and they just said, okay, this one's diagnostic, this one's non-diagnostic. But there was no 
they didn't really specify why. And then when they did the, the follow-up, uh, you know, when they when they got the results back, I don't know if they went back to the radiologist and asked them, like, you know, why the um, why do you think the algorithm spit out non-diagnostic versus why you said this is diagnostic? They didn't. I mean, they didn't. If they did that, they didn't say it in the paper. But I don't think they did, to be honest, because they kind of got. And, I, and I'm going to kind of go through it a little bit. Um, they got, I think, 12 or 16 cases back where they didn't really know what was wrong with the images, and then they didn't. They just kind of left it as an unknown. They're like, well, these images are. You know, the, the algorithm said they're non-diagnostic. The radiologists say they're diagnostic, but we don't know why. And so it's kind of, I don't know why they why they did that and why they didn't investigate further. Because if they did, then it, I mean, then they can improve their, their deep learning algorithm, or they could just throw those pieces away and not use them for training. That kind of thing. I guess my question is like, I think, yeah, I think that um, they're, what they want to be able to do is help the technologists flag non-diagnostic cases. Um, but, I mean, in this case, it's not, you know, the algorithm is not like even 95% accurate. So, um, I mean, it would probably help them a little bit, but there still has to be um, a user there watching the cases and, you know, saying, well, this is non-diagnostic. And they, you know, have the algorithm maybe confirm that. Um, you know, so I think that's that's what I got from this paper. So in, they have this uh, initially they have the model field, and the thing they, they finally they find their gold standard and the uh, borderline cases whatever. So if they get this the patient the cases uh, the number increase, do you see their model can be easily expandable? Like they can learn themselves. Um, uh, that's the field here. You mean like a, oh sorry, so you mean like um, if they keep getting cases yeah, back and they yeah. can identify them yeah, correctly and then, the yeah, yeah, they, they do mention that in the paper, so they say, well, we keep training this this, uh, this algorithm um, so that the, yeah, so it can get smarter and smarter, yeah. Um, but, so yeah, like the number of cases they use is pretty small, you know, so if they kept, if they kept going, I think it would be more robust. Okay, should I keep going? Those are good questions. So, uh, if you have any other questions, I, I'll I'll answer them. I still want to go way over time. Um, so, maybe I'll just skip the this part here. But basically, um, they just went into detail. Um, so yeah, so 23 cases um, where the readers agreed that they that the cases were diagnostic. The, the algorithm labeled them as non-diagnostic, and then they said the reason for this importance is unknown. So they didn't go back to the radiologist and ask them, like, why did you label this as diagnostic when it's non-diagnostic? Um, um, and then for eight of the cases where there was agreement between the readers that the cases were non-diagnostic, the algorithm, algorithm labeled them as diagnostic. Um, and then they said the reason that they gave was that these cases had no readily discernible features. So that was, that was the only explanation that they gave um, in the paper. Um, so then for the results, uh, oh, I'll keep going here, so um, they just kind of looked at the similarities between the training and the validation data. So they said that there's no significant difference between the two groups um, with respect to the presence or absence of liver cirrhosis or liver lesions, and the p-values were all greater than 0.05. Um, so they, they did discuss, like they did pick out what the images were that um, those unknown images. So they had four liver lesions, and then they had 12. Uh, 12 of them had um, inter-homogeneous subcutaneous fat suppression. Um, but they didn't really explain why. They just said, "Oh, well, this, these, are, these images, we don't know what you know what happened." Um, and then, <coughs> and then they kind of discussed, "Well, these are things that we can do to improve our algorithm. So limit the portion of the image that's being analyzed in the algorithm." So they didn't have to use this whole image. They could probably use just a portion of the image, although they didn't specify which portion of the image. Um, that would go in, um, or have more radiologists assess these images um, to improve intra-reader variability. They only had two. Um, 
they still believe that the deep learning algorithm can be used um, to flag non-diagnostic non cases, although, I mean, it's not even 95% accurate, so I, I mean, maybe it would help. Um, and then just to conclude, um, I think that they, they did answer their objective, like they, they tried to, and they just think that they didn't have the results that they had, that they had hoped for, but they, they did achieve their objective of, you know, trying to determine which cases were not diagnostic and, um, um, by feeding them through the, the CNN algorithm. Um, they said that their NPV was high due to low number of false negatives, and then their PPV was low, as some of the cases were flagged as non-diagnostic. Um, the authors didn't extrapolate beyond this data because they were just testing an algorithm, and um, there was no comparison to any previous study as well. So, thank you, and if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes? Um, a couple things. One is, I'm not sure if throwing out the borderline cases is a good idea, because those, that's where the need is, it seems to me. It's like the ones that everybody obviously thinks is diagnostic or not diagnostic. You know, the test probably already knows that. It's like, what to do with those ones in the middle? And I can imagine it gets better. Like, so if the algorithm said, if you say, oh, all the, all the observers say these are diagnostic, and the algorithm does not, yeah. it's an opportunity. Oh, sorry. To yeah, I didn't say that to throw out anything that's borderline. I just meant that the reader should agree on which ones, um, that, that there should be more uh, agreement between the readers on which ones are diagnostic versus non diagnostic on the borderline ones. It might be helpful, but you could operationally, it could be that there's if either of the observers says that it's not diagnostic, then it's not diagnostic. Right. And and then um, and, and then at the end, whether it's useful or not, if out of the 170 or however many it was, there's only 12 that, that, that are discordant, you could still provide those to whoever is on that day, the physician on that day, and say these were non diagnostic were identified as non diagnostic. What do you do? You want us to read? You know, so right. it is still a value, even as, as, as Robert says, even as crappy as the study is, it still sort of indicates that there's, there's potential there to be a value, because you are limiting the ones that you have a question on to a reasonably small number, it seems like, as opposed to having to read them all. Yeah, and it seems like the one, uh, I forget, non-diagnostic versus diagnostic, it just, because what deep learning is trying to do is just extract features, so it just sounded like uh, some of the images that were being fed through, there just was no feature that they could extract and say, oh yeah, this is for sure liver cirrhosis, or oh no, this is for sure non-diagnostic, because some of those borderline cases where they could be non-diagnostic could have discernible features, and then the algorithm would say, oh, this is for sure diagnostic, whereas the radiologist would say, well, no, I can't see. Yeah, so there's, there may be a little bit of that, and I, I don't know how they would, uh, I mean, they have to test the deep learning algorithm. I don't know if you can, uh, the thing is, I'm not, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about these deep learning and how to actually test each layer, but if they could do that, I would, I mean, that's fairly obvious to me, like I would go through and test each layer and say, okay, well, which, is, which, what feature is this layer extracting, which feature, no, you can't do that. Okay, well then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, I guess what you'd have to do is basically just, you know, um, pick out images that you knew for sure were non-diagnostic versus diagnostic, and some borderline cases have the readers agree on which ones, and then, uh, you could test, you'd have to test the algorithm that way, but that is how you test the algorithm. So, I mean, yeah, I guess you can't go in and, you know, um, test each layer. So, it's kind of a, that's why they call it a black box. Well, did it be helpful if you were just with the images with non diagnostic and the radiologist that we had to read the detail? That, that would have been helpful, because um, all I, like, what I understood was that, um, the Not just the kind of Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, um, they could say, well, this is the feature that hopefully the algorithm will extract and say is this, you know, um, that this is diagnostic and there's liver cirrhosis, for example. So I think that's, I mean, that's what I li would have liked to see in the paper. Um, I think overall I did like it because I had to research a whole lot about deep learning and I didn't know a whole lot about it. So hopefully you learned a little bit about deep learning um, this talk, a little bit. <laughs>